so much for this very, very kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me. Okay. All right. Let's let's get going. And and you guys see my I see my screen is breaking up with Excel, how to write reproducible uh, reports with R markdown. Um, okay. So today what I'm gonna try to do is um, is I'm going to try to convey some ideas uh, about how we should do data analysis that may maybe seem a little bit pie in the sky and aspirational. Uh, however, um, uh, they are uh, emerging and may soon uh, uh, be standard both in academic research and also in clinical operations, uh, especially in laboratory medicine. Uh, and by the way, you don't have to take any notes. Um, at the end of the lecture, I'll, sh I'll share a link to a website that I made for this lecture that has all the slides and all the materials and some resources that I'll be mentioning during the lecture. Uh, so I have no disclosures uh, relating to the topic I'm discussing today. So, so this is going to be a talk about clinical data analysis. And uh, what I'm going to assume is that you're a clinician, uh, more specifically a pathologist, um, and most likely in training, uh, but not necessarily. Uh, I will also assume that you, that you have or will at some point have a professional responsibility to analyze and interpret data for clinical, operational, or research purposes. And finally, I will assume that you all have worked uh, with Microsoft Excel or some other kind of spreadsheet software, and therefore have um, at least a passing familiarity with spreadsheet-based data analysis. So my goal is that after today's lecture, you'll be able to uh, explain why analyzing data with Excel uh, or similar spreadsheet kind of software can compromise data quality and may ultimately lead to patient harm. Uh, that you'll be able to describe some key features of what I will call a reproducible workflow for data analysis. And finally, uh, that you'll be able to define the term uh, computational document. Oh, here it is. Computational document. Uh, and a computational document is a key ingredient of a reproducible workflow. And if the technology plays along uh, today, uh, uh, we'll do a quick exercise at the end in which we'll uh, try to uh, put together a document that's written in R Markdown, which is the type of computational document that we use here at the Children's Hospital. Uh, so this is going to be an interactive session, and it's a, it's a small group. So, so feel free to unmute and ask questions if something's unclear. Uh, and no worries about the exercise I just mentioned. You don't have to install anything on your computer. Um, the, the way we're going to do this is I'm going to post a, a link in the chat to a, uh, a browser-based, a web-based environment that I've set up for this to, for us to play with our markdown, each person in their own uh, session. So uh, reproducibility in Excel. Um, so in this lecture, I'm going to argue that reproducibility is important. And for that reason, I'd like to start, uh, to, to start by defining reproducibility by contrasting it with the related but distinct concept of replicability. So replicability is the extent to which uh, the findings of a studies are generalizable, meaning that someone else can redo the entire study and get the same result and come to the same conclusions. So what people sometimes call the reproducibility crisis, where pharmaceutical companies like Amgen and Bayer and others reported that they often can't confirm the results of landmark studies, which you may have heard of, that is more precisely called a replicability crisis or a replication crisis. So replication. So for replication, what you need to do is you need to collect new data, which is often difficult in time, or at least time consuming. Uh, but replication is the scientific gold standard for the validity of a study. In contrast, reproducibility uh, is the extent to which you can uh, exactly, so given the same raw data, the is, uh, reproducibility is the extent to which you can exactly repeat the data analysis, meaning that someone else can same, take the same raw data that you've collected and get the exact same result. So for reproduction, you use the same data, uh, which makes it much easier than uh, to do than replication because you don't have to recollect new data. Um, it's, it's important to be aware that reproduction does not show by itself that the study is valid because there could be problems with how the data were collected and there could be also errors in the analysis pipeline itself. But as data analysis part of studies becomes more and more complex, um, reproducibility uh, becomes more important. And for that reason, reproducibility has been proposed as a minimum standard uh, for the scientific, uh, for judging the scientific validity of a, of a study. And it's becoming actually more and more common that academic journals when you submit an article that they request submission of your analysis code for peer review 
And that's especially true for high throughput kinds of uh, studies. Um, so it's a, to put this idea visually, and in, in very, very general terms, uh, and I know this is a, a pathology talk, and I'm, I'm making some, some very general statements, uh, but uh, so in very general terms, um, it, it, the, the, the idea is that you, we collect some data from nature, and then we use that, so, so this, we just collect some raw data from nature, and then we use that data to get some results that allow us to draw some general conclusions about nature. Um, and replicability means that the entire process can be repeated and you get the same results. Then you have a replicated valid study. Okay. Reproducibility only looks at that second half of that arc. You start with the same raw data and you try to reach the same results. Now, why does reproducibility suddenly seem like such a big problem? Uh, so, with the advent of high throughput biology and machine learning, the number of data points that go into a single study have exploded. So you have tons and tons of data points. And so has the complexity of the algorithms with which these data points are processed to produce the figures and the tables on which we, you know, which, which are presented to us and which we base our conclusions. And the methods section of journal articles just aren't suitable to capture and describe this complexity. So in modern papers, data processing is rarely described well enough to allow for exact reproduction of the results. And while exact reproduction is maybe not always essential, if you have poor documentation of methods, that can become dangerous because it can obscure not only data processing methods, but also make it hard to spot errors in data processing. And I next want to look at a case study that illustrates this point. So in the mid-2000s, Anil Potty and Joseph Nevins of Duke University tried to predict sensitivity of tumor cells to chemotherapeutic agents, and, and they did this using microarray gene expression data. So, so this, these were some of the first papers that used microarrays for, for uh, uh, personalized oncology, and so they generated a ton of excitement at the time. And these papers got published in high-profile journals like JAMA and Lancet Oncology, Nature Medicine, and the New England Journal of Medicine. So unfortunately, there were a number of uh, serious errors in that data analysis. And, um, and there's actually a, a, a 60 minutes uh, segment on this, but in, in that, in, in the, well, in the media, the media coverage of this was such that they focused on the fact that the research tried to cover up uh, these errors and press towards clinical trials. Um, even though at the time there were open questions about their methods, um, and, uh, and they, they, they didn't um, they didn't really focus so much on the root causes of these errors. But that's what I'm talking about today. So unfortunately, uh, 110 patients were enrolled in four clinical trials, and they were allocated on chemotherapy treatment arms based on these uh, on these flawed models. And in the end, after the dust settled, 18 papers had to be retracted. And Duke settled a number of lawsuits for an undisclosed amount of money. Um, so how did all of this get uncovered? So when the Duke cancer paper started coming out, um, they were so exciting and they were so novel and so important that investigators at some other institutions were keen to use these methods for their own research questions. And so at the first step, these researchers uh, wanted to um, independently reanalyze the data from the published study because, because the authors had to, um, to deposit the raw microarray data in a public repository. Uh, so, they, so they wanted to take that raw data and independently reanalyze that data and see whether they get the same results. And two of these researchers are uh, Keith Baggerly, right here on the left, and Kevin Coombs from, uh, from the Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. <clears throat> so, so they started with the raw data, which was deposited in a public you know, deposit in a public depository like GenBank or uh, uh, what have you. And then they tried to, then they read the methods section and tried to follow exactly the steps that were uh, described there, but they got completely different results. And they tried for a long time to sort out these inconsistencies with the authors of the paper, but um, in, in Keith Baggerly's words, the data just didn't add up. So the analysis as reported was not reproducible. Because there was no, also no code available that you could just download and run the analysis. But you know, it was all Excel based. Anyways, so when the MD Anderson team learned that these flawed predictive models 
were starting to be used in cancer clinical trials, they got concerned enough to start an extensive forensic bioinformatics effort to prove that the models were unreliable and that patients were being placed at risk. So, so, so what I mean by forensic bioinformatics? By forensic bioinformatics, um, which is a word that Keith Baggerly invented, and there's, there's a great, like, very short interview about this that I, that, that, that I encourage all of you to watch after this lecture, I'm going to post on the website. So forensic bioinformatics, it means you completely ignore the methods section. And then you ask the question, what must they have done to the raw data to get the results that they've presented? So you reconstruct, so you reverse engineer the results um, from the data. And then, and so, so this was some painstaking detective work. And according to Keith Baggerty, they spent more than a thousand hours on this question. So using this bio, forensic bioinformatic approach, they were actually able to reconstruct a number of errors that explained the incorrectly reported results. And here's one of the errors that they found in one of the main data sets. So these are a few of the hundreds of microarray probe sets. So each one of these is sort of a code for, um, that, that roughly corresponds to a gene. Uh, these are not gene names, but they're probe names. Uh, but each one of them roughly corresponds to a gene. Um, and, and these are the probe sets that the Duke investigators reported. Uh, if you look at these, you can predict the uh, sensitivity to 5-fluorouracils, to 5 of you. And here are the probe sets that the MD Anderson team got. And you can see that they're not the same, right? They're different. Um, but if I highlight uh, the, the last number of these, these probe, probes, can you appreciate the pattern? So wh who sees the pattern? Type your answer in the chat. They added one number to each one? Yes, exactly. So, so that's exactly right. Um, so so this, is, uh, this is what's called an off by one indexing error. And this is what happens when you copy and paste values from Excel one column at a time. And in one of the columns, you grab the wrong starting row. So you're you know, off by so this may be a header row. So maybe you have uh, one column with a header and one without a header. And so everything gets shifted by one. And this is a pretty easy error to make. Uh, but you, as you might imagine, this completely messes up the results, right? Because 1A, 1A, T, and 1A, 2, G, A, T, they're not really like related to each other in any, in any biological way. They're completely different sets of genes. So, um, so you get complete mess. So this is this off by one indexing error. So that's an Excel kind of error. But this was only one of the many simple errors that the MD Anderson team discovered by looking at this study very closely. Um, another type of error, um, which, was, which they saw more than once, is, is, is what's called label reversal. So in more than one case, a cell line that um, was labeled as sensitive to a chemo drug was actually resistant and vice versa. And that type of error can lead to a scenario where a patient, you know, if, if you use that model all the way down to the clinical trials, then the patient would get the chemotherapy that would be predicted to be least beneficial instead of most beneficial. So that's pretty scary. Um, so these are all pretty simple errors. Uh, you don't have to be incompetent or egregiously negligent to make them. And because they're so easy to make, uh, and without good documentation or reproducible workflow, it's hard to catch them. And, uh, and, uh, and they're also very common. So one of the main takeaways of the, from this case study is that a critical barrier to reproducing your study, to reproducibility, is the tendency of people to use graphical user interface point and click type of tools like Microsoft Excel. And I'm not saying that everybody has to stop using Microsoft Excel, but I'm but I'm but I want to point out and I want you guys to be aware of this idea that that point of point and click to, to type of tools are not reproducible. Uh, and the reason they're not reproducible is because they don't they don't record user interactions, um, and and so and so that there is there is a potential for uh, uh, there's a serious potential for error in this, um, and, and I think this should be a cause of concern if you if you do have a professional responsibility to use clinical data to generate results that will affect patient care, uh, because it can lead to scenarios where you know, you know a well-meaning clinician argues in good faith for managing patients a certain way but the underlying analysis is flawed, and then results in a poor outcome. Now, now this is kind of a negative way of putting it, because, um, uh, and so, so I want to frame it more positively here. 
Um, so if you, if you, on the other hand, you routinely, you, you can figure out a way to routinely adopt a reproducible workflow for your data analysis work, it'll be that much easier for you to weed out these kinds of simple errors that are so common and annoying. And, um, and that means that you can also be more confident that your analysis results are valid and you don't have to go back and double check and triple check your, your work. So, uh, so, so these are sort of some of the benefits here. So let's do another quick your turn. Um, take um, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna read these uh, read these options, and the question is gonna be which one of the following statements is not true, and then I want you guys, everybody, to either to uh, to to post either A, B, C, or D uh, for what they think the correct answer is. So which of the following statements is not true? And I'm just I'm just doing this to. <laughs> To kind of keep this a little bit interactive, not trying to, not trying to quiz you here. So, uh, which ones of the following statements is not true? A. An off by one indexing error commonly occurs when a workflow requires copying columns from Excel and pasting into another application. B. Label reversal errors commonly occur when a categorical variable is expressed as numbers, for example, zero and one, instead of names. For example, sensitive and resistant. C. Reproducibility has been proposed as the gold standard for scientific validity. Or D, both B and C. All right, I see one answer. 15 seconds left. <laughs> okay. All right. I see a few Cs. Okay, and that is the correct answer. So the correct answer is C because. Uh, because it's replicability or replication is the gold standard for scientific validity. Reproducibility, on the other hand, is it really just looks at the second half of the arc of you know tr truth finding, um, and it's um, uh, but it's not the gold standard because you might have uh, you might have had issues with uh, uh, that happened before the data analysis. So uh, so uh, you guys did a good job. All right, great. Um, okay. So before we look at reproducible data analysis workflows, um, let's really come up with a conceptual, like a mental model of uh, what a typical data analysis project looks like. And this could be a research project, or this could be you know, a clinical operations, uh, you, know, you know, like an audit, or it could be anything really. So and it would go something like this. So you begin by roughly defining the goals and objectives of a project, and then identify uh, you know, the data that you need to meet those goals. And then you import the data, which means bringing it into your anal analytics software in some way. So that could be loading, you know, a, a, an Excel sheet into Excel, or it could be like loading a, 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 a CSV file into SAS or into R. Uh, I'll talk about R later. And then you tidy the data, which by which I mean reshaping it for analysis and also performing some data quality control, um, making sure that it, it makes sense. Um, uh, and and do some QC, and usually the next step will be trans will be to transform the data in some way, in order to prepare it for a specific analysis. So perhaps you'll you'll want to filter out patient visits from a specific year in a hospital unit, or maybe you want to actually combine two data tables. Maybe one of them has treatments of interest, and the other one has outcomes of interest. And you want it all in the same table. So it could be really any number of things. So that's that's transform, and then the two main engines of generating knowledge are in data analysis, are visualization and modeling. Uh, and modeling could be you know, any kind of summary statistics or it could be a machine learning model, so anything, anything that's mathematic. Um, and visualization is any kind, of, any, kind of, any kind of plot or a picture. Or actually a, a, a summary uh, display table. So in a typical data analysis, transforming, visualizing, and modeling that that happens not that happens not only once, but it but but it may happen over and over. And this is what's called the understand cycle. Um, and the quality of the analysis uh, it really depends on whether that cycle has been iterated a sufficient number of times to um, to to uh, correct to address the question that you're asking and get to a point where you have a definitive answer. If for some things you really only have to do this once or twice, for example, for like you know, most audits that you'll do, maybe you'll, you'll look at it like once or twice or three times, uh, double or triple checking things. But for other things, for example, building complicated machine learning models, you have to do this many, many, many times until you get to something that actually works. And so the final critical piece, so that's the understand cycle. 
And the final critical piece is communication of your new insights in such a way that they'll eventually get turned in a, into action. And that could be through a publication or a report uh, to a stakeholder or, you know, uh, or, or some other way that the analysis can be used for decision making. So I know very high level conceptual uh, ideas here. And we're going to get more into specifics in a little bit. Um, so now data analysis usually happens as a collaborative effort. So I usually have some sort of a domain expert. And this in a hospital, this could be an attending or lab director. Uh, and then you have a technical user, which could be an analyst or a technologist, or oftentimes it's going to be you as a trainee, right? Uh, you're going to do the work. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, one person actually plays both of these roles. But for the sake of an example, let's say you have a blood bank director, a domain expert, who asks an analyst to compose an audit of uh, last year's transfusion reactions. So, so the director might send a list of uh, patients who have had transfusion reactions to the analyst, and oftentimes that list is going to be an Excel sheet. Right? Then the analyst goes through, um, through the list and might manually add columns to the relevant data, and they may create multiple versions, their, their own multiple versions of that sheet. And this effectively creates a si silos um, that the domain answer doesn't the domain expert doesn't have any insight into. And as we've seen, errors will likely be made in this silo that will be hard to spot be if you're using Excel because it doesn't record user interactions. So the, the domain expert can only see what happened to the Excel sheet, and they can only really learn from what happened by asking the, uh, the, the technical user, but they can't like, know that uh, they didn't make a mistake uh, because there's no record of what actually happened uh, in the data analysis. So imagine that instead you could eliminate Excel from these intermediate steps and have the lab director and the analyst work together on each step of the data analysis. And you had a way to ensure that the entire analysis can be automatically reproduced by a computer at any time in the project. And you have the code, uh, like the computer code and the reasoning, which describes what the user code does, available for inspection at all times. And this reproducible workflow would allow for closer collaboration more transparency, and also, um, you know, after you know the um, initial um, time investment to to uh, to learn these new tools, it would actually also save times because you catch data problems earlier, and you can more rapidly iterate this understand cycle, uh, and, and you'd have eliminated you'd eliminate much of the back and forth spent in trying to communicate what was technically done, rather than getting through the results. So this workflow is made possible by eliminating spreadsheets and adopting a new new tool called a computational document. So a computational document is a document that contains executable computer code. So let me say that again. So a computational document is a document, like a Word document or you know a text document, you know, if with the exception that it, it, as an extra, it has computer code that you can run. So before I show you what a computational document looks like, and how it fits into a reproducible workflow. <clears throat> Let me introduce three terms that may or may not be new. Uh, may or may not be new to you. The first is R. R is a programming language for data analysis, and um, uh, and there are lots of things that make R our preferred language at CHOP. It's freely available. It makes it easy uh, to wrangle complex data sets, and it can produce publication quality visualizations. Also, you can, you, you can use R directly to pull data from any of the databases that we use at CHOP, such as EPIC, uh, or our lab information system, or our clinical data warehouse. And, and there's, there's a, an important other piece of this is that there's actually really a really open and welcoming community of people that use R uh, professionally or, uh, you know, or in their free time. So it's, it's, a, it's a, great, you know, uh, a great community. And finally, doing basic data analysis with R is actually not that difficult to learn, even if you're not a computer programmer and you've never written a single line of code. Um, then there's R Markdown. R Markdown is a computational document format. That, um, and uh, because it's a computational document format, it means you can put executable code into it. And that code is usually written in R. Uh, I say usually because it's actually possible to write code in Python or other languages inside of an R Markdown document if that's what you want to do. 
but you know, usually, usually I was, you know, usually you use R because uh, we like R. And finally, there's uh, R Studio. So R Studio is the name of a company and also the name of a piece of software that this company makes and makes available for free. Uh, you can think of R Studio as a fancy editor for writing, as a fancy text editor uh, for writing R and R Markdown. And you can run R Studio on Mac and Windows. Or if you're concerned about protecting you know, sensitive data, like patient data or intellectual property, it's also possible to lock down an R Studio um, uh, server behind the hospital firewall. Um, and by the way, if you're interested in installing R and R Studio after you, on your computer after today, I put links uh, for this uh, on a website that I made for this lecture that I'll post in the chat at the end of the lecture. So an R Markdown document is a regular text file that has marks uh, to add styling. Uh, for example, here we see um, um, uh, here we see one or two hashtags at the beginning of a line, um, and these hashtags tell our markdown this is a level one header, this is like a large header, and this is a level two header. So two two hashtags are level two and a little bit smaller, um, and um, and, and similarly, you can you can use asterisks at the beginning of a line to make a bulleted list, uh, and you can style text uh, cursive or italic by surrounding it with a single asterisk or a bold faced if you put two asterisks around it. And you can add hyperlinks, and you can do a, a whole bunch of other uh, kind of uh, uh, markups. Um, and a key idea is that you can convert this raw R Markdown document into a final target format that's appropriate for viewing. And here's what this R Markdown on the left will look like uh, if it were converted to HTML. And HTML is the format that web browsers use, and that's the default target format of R Markdown, but it's possible to convert it to others. So you can see that the one hashtag uh, equals large header thing uh, turned into a, a sort of a big, uh, a big header. Um, and you can see the, the, the bullets and the cursive and the bold-faced styling that come out uh, after the conversion. What makes our markdown a computational document format is that we can include computer code, right? Uh, when you add computer code to an R markdown document, it's, it's, it's called a code chunk. And this code here, um, I'm only showing it to illustrate, no, don't worry about how it works, is, uh, is some R code that generates 100 normally distributed uh, random numbers and then, then assigns them to a variable called x, and then it calls the summary function on x. And as you can see in the rendered document, that code chunk is placed neatly in a gray box to make it visually distinct from the narrative text above. And R Markdown also actually runs that code and shows the result right below the code. And this way, you get a neatly formatted report um, that shows the code, uh, and then the results of the code uh, right below um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so, so, so what, you, what you can imagine, you can use this for first writing uh, on top, you know, this is, this, is, this is an audit that we're doing for the, uh, you know, for the blood bank, and then here you write how you would load in your data and how you would analyze it, and then you get sort of the, uh, a summary table or a graph right below it, all in, in one document. And anybody who gets this document can rerun it, and it automatically regenerates it. So um, you can also include plots and other graphical elements. And here we're running uh, what's called the hist function on x. And uh, what, what, uh, what this turns into is, is the, um, uh, the rendered document shows a hist ram of the values in x. So, so, you, so you're right, uh, Ali, um, uh, pictures and graphs are also uh, pieces of a computational document. So, so, in, um, so we use our markdown extensively at CHOP uh, as the substrate for for these kinds of reproducible data analysis workflows, where you know somebody would would start typing up this document, and then um, and then uh, and then share it with a collaborator who can rerun it and then look at it and and uh, make maybe some edits and send it back. But at all times, you can actually run and rerun and rerun the thing, and you're not reliant on uh, you know somebody doing a complex manual. Uh, uh, a modification to the data that later on becomes not reproducible. Um, yeah. So, and as I've just 
shown, you can uh, convert these R Markdown documents into a bunch of different target formats, such as HTML, PDF, but you can also turn them into Microsoft Word and PowerPoint. And you can even turn them into interactive dashboards. And um, the way this works is that your R Markdown document gets, gets uh, converted into an HTML file, uh, but then it also uploads that HTML file to a server that makes it available on the internet or maybe your internal, you know, your hospital or private network. And so you can deploy dashboards either in the cloud or on-premise. And, um, uh, and uh, uh, so, so if, you want to, um, uh, uh, if you want to deploy a dashboard that's public-facing, it doesn't show any sensitive data, you can do that. Or for internal-facing apps, um, and there's use cases for this uh, that may contain sensitive data, uh, you can do that as well. And at job we do that uh, extensively. Um, so here, dashboards are a great way to communicate results because they display key data on demand. And they are increasingly being used by clinical labs. Like, for example, uh, this uh, COVID-19 testing dashboard of the University of Washington lab, Medi Medicine Virology Lab. Um, and this dashboard is written in R Markdown, actually. But you, in order to use it, you don't need to know any R, uh, which is very cool. So you just point your browser to the website, and it's actually publicly available. Uh, you can Google uh, UW uh, Medicine Virology, uh, Virology COVID-19 Dashboard, and you'll find this thing. So, um, so you just point your browser to the website, and then you can see at a glance some key performance indicators, such as the total uh, samples tested to date, which is of yesterday's a whopping 2.6 million. Um, and uh, other numbers such as test positivity rate, uh, daily positives, and so on. Uh, in addition, it, there uh, there's a histogram of test volume over time, which you can see below here. And it's, uh, it's color-coded by result. Um, so the, the, the blue ones are, uh, are uh, not detected, and uh, the brown ones are positive. Um, so what I can show here is because I'm, I'm showing you a PowerPoint slide, is that this histogram is actually an interactive plot that lets me zoom in and get more detailed information by hovering over specific bars. And you can make this kind of thing with R Markdown. At CHOP, we've created a number of dashboards that, uh, um, uh, that were also either entirely written in R Markdown or you know, we built prototypes in R Markdown um, uh, uh, to, to deploy them. And here's a dashboard of the Division of Genomic Diagnostics that displays test volumes and turnaround times for the various uh, molecular tests that we do. Um, and one area where R Markdown powered dashboards really shine is when a lab information system provides 90% of your necessary functionality and you need to custom build or, you know, uh, you need to custom build the remaining 10%. And here's a dashboard that we created, or actually it's more like a web app that we created um, also in R Markdown to support the bone marrow transplant patients and deciding whether or not a stem cell collection is complete or more stem cells are, need, are needed to be collected the next day. Um, so this is a clinical decision support. We implemented a, a simple predictive algorithm that takes into account specific clinical and lab data. And we're still testing this, but I think it'll eventually reduce the number of unnecessary stem cell collections significantly. Um, so uh, I really believe that knowing just a little bit of coding, especially when you're, you know, when you're doing with R and R Markdown, is really powerful if you're a lab leader, because then you can make you can take more effective ownership and be more actively involved in developing and implementing these kinds of tools. Even if you know you don't, you, you, you never have to become a very good programmer, but you'll be able to uh, direct you know programmers in your division or in your hospital system, uh, and um, you, you know better what they can do or cannot do, and um, and so, so this is this is why I encourage. Um, I really encourage clinicians to uh, to to um, to learn like the very basics of data analysis skills uh, with R, and I'll I'll provide some resources for how you can do that if you if you're interested. So <clears throat> so to to recap um, uh, what we've covered up to this point, and I realize it's a lot. Uh, we covered a lot of ground. The the first point I, I I try to make is that analyzing data with Excel can compromise. Um, uh, data quality and may ultimately lead to patient harm. And this is because Excel does not record user interactions and is easy to make simple errors and can be very difficult to uncover later. Instead, um, if you um, 
if you can implement a reproducible workflow uh, for your data analysis, in which the entire analysis is automated with computer code. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it said you can do that. And, and we look at how, you, how that can improve your confidence in the validity of an analysis. And um, a computational document is a document that contains uh, uh, executable computer code. And the computational document is a key ingredient of reproducible workflows. And R Markdown is a computational document format that's commonly used in lab medicine. And finally, we looked at dashboards, which can support lab operations and can be built with R Markdown. So knowledge of R Markdown can therefore help uh, lab leaders build more effective dashboards. So let's do one more, um, one more your turn. Uh, and again, uh, type, take, take a minute and type the answer into the chat. Yes, I see a lot of Bs. OK, you guys are awesome. That's exactly right. And um, uh, does anybody want to say why they picked B? I think it's a transform visualize model. Not yeah, study. exactly. That's right. You, and and um, yeah, it's, it, it, seemed, it seemed, yeah, I, I, the, 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 that's right. So you really only have to tidy your data once. You really only have to do your data quality control check once in this, in this cycle, but then you for each time you, 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 you create a graph or a different kind of table, you have to make a new transformation, which is like gluing together. Oftentimes, it's, it's gluing together two different data sets into one, or, uh, or filtering or, um, or, or, or separating out specific subsets of the data. So that's exactly right. Uh, uh, thank you, Matt. OK, so we have a little bit of time left. And um, let's try. Um, so this 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 part of the session is a little bit experimental. So I hope uh, I hope it will work. Uh, in the last few minutes, I want to I want let, let's practice writing some R markdown. So now I I just wanted to uh, uh, as promised uh, I wanted to 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 share a link to the website I made for this class. But um, if you want to do more R and R markdown practice, uh, and I think you should, <laughs> but I'm biased. So if you want to do that, uh, you can uh, you can install R and R Markdown on your computer um, uh, for free. And I have a video with step-by-step -step instructions on this website uh, for how to do that. Um, I also have listed some resources there with next step for learning more. And I'm also always happy to chat about learning R. That's you know, one of my I love talking about that stuff. So uh, so if you have questions or if you want some pointers. Um, just uh, just shoot me an email, but but take a look at this website first. I put together for you guys, um, because it may have some of the answers to questions that you might have after this session. And then, uh, if you could all, if you all could do me a favor, uh, please fill out the super quick two question feedback form. Uh, this is a, a, I, I need I need these I need these uh, this feedback for my you know for my teaching evaluations, and so it would help me a lot if you can. Uh, if you could fill this out, and and I take this feedback very seriously, and I use it to guide revisions of my, of my teaching. So, again, um, thanks for your participation. Uh, thanks for having me, and I'm also gonna post this, uh, post the feedback form in the chat so you have it available. Um, so thanks again for having me. Uh, we're at the top of the hour, but um, I I can stick around and answer some questions if you guys have any. Uh, thanks again for having me. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for this interactive session. I, I, I'm personally, like now, um, I have the basic or the foundation basics of the R and the R markdown. Uh, to be honest, this is the first time for me to, uh, to hear about the R markdown. I heard about the R and R studio, but yeah, it's, it's a good to have like something to document every cause and everything. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree, and I think it's um, I think it's still pretty new, but I think it's uh, there are um, if you if you go to uh, 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 AACC or to uh, Pathology Informatics, uh, we're not the only ones who are using this, and it, it's 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 very transformative, and it, it's very useful, and I think uh, I think it's a it's a very good idea if you're a trainee uh, these days to uh, to learn about some of the stuff because. One at this time, it'll be like like I said, coding is a superpower. Uh, people would be very interested uh, to uh, to uh, in you as a as an applicant if you can say, well, I know I know some some a little bit of R. I've done a little bit of R in my residency, 
Uh, it certainly was like that for me when I applied to faculty positions. Uh, people wanted to know much more about my computer stuff and my transfusion stuff. So that's, that was that was a big thing. Uh, uh, and also, you know, like if you if you don't learn it now, you might have to actually learn it later. So so now now is a good time. <laughs> To, to get into this, I think, for if you're a resident or if you're a fellow. Um, yeah. Definitely increases your marketability as a job applicant, um, in my experience. Uh, do we have any other resources, like open, uh, free open sources for the residents if they are interested in art to learn more, like courses or anything? Yes, I'm, I'm, glad, yes. You, I'm glad you asked, because if you go to the website I just posted in the, uh, in the um, uh, in the chat that I set up for the course, it does have those. Oh, okay. It does That's have those, okay. but but I but I'm happy to 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 go over this for a second. I just have to find it myself. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, give me a sec. Okay, so our training lecture UAMS 20, 2001. So um, so I um um. So here are the step-by-step -step instructions. So these, these are YouTube videos that walk you through how to do this on Mac and Windows. Uh, so this is just really going to take 10 minutes to do. Um, and the interview with Keith Baggerly, like he, 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 he uh, explains this whole, uh, uh, this whole idea of um, reproducibility and of, uh, of uh, uh, forensic bioinformatics way better than I ever could. Uh, the um, the best uh, free um, uh, resource for self learning is R for data science, and, okay. and 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 that's a that's a book that's that's free for you to read, um, and oh. and it comes it comes with lots of uh, lots of exercises and there's also a solutions <laughs> manual online, so oh, so, so this is good for self learning, uh, mm -hmm. but but I but I highly highly recommend that before you start reading this thing. I, at least if you take at least one uh, actual like a workshop like a course okay. to, to do this and and two of them are actually coming up um, one is at the uh, pathology informatics at the AP, uh, at API and I'm, I'm teaching this together with uh, with a few other faculty with Amram Oxfeld and the other one is at the uh, our medicine conference which I'm chairing in a you know I'm, uh, I'm uh, a uh, oh yeah, I, I was planning to attend, but unfortunately, I will be in the airport and airplane. I'm okay. Like, okay. I, I have a, like a vacation. Yeah. Uh, but that, I, I, I know that you will record this and uh, it will be available for the Association of Pathology Informatics EBI, right? So that's correct. Yeah. So we have so 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 so, so pathology informatics. Um, uh, that, that, so that's going to be a workshop, and a very similar workshop is going to be at our medicine. Uh, intro oh, to R okay. for medical data. Yeah. Um, record this R yeah. medicine. Yeah. When will this be? Like. Uh, On the twenty fourth. Twenty fourth of August. Yeah. Okay, that's perfect for me. Yeah, and um, uh, so so the registration for this is ten bucks, but I'm the chair, so if you uh, if you um, uh, if any of you are interested. Uh, I can I can I can get you free tickets to this. Um, so uh, so so I'm happy to provide that. Uh, okay, I I will show that. I will send you an email about this. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, yeah. Uh, do I think our residents do? do uh, does anyone have any question? Okay, I think some of them say thank you. Okay. Thank I know. you very much. Yeah, I know I've blessed you with a lot of information here, and it was not really pathology specific, but it's something that I feel very, you know, very <laughs> passionate about. I, I will send them a follow up yeah. email with the, all this links and all of this stuff. Yeah. Cool. And uh, slides you can you can download them here as well on this. Okay. Website, so. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. And right. Thank you for your time. Thanks yeah, very much for bye. having me. <laughs> uh, have a nice day, all. <laughs>